We are going online. Oops. Yes, we are online now. Perfect. Hello, I warmly welcome you to our 50th webinar. Um, our webinar is uh, organized by the Academy of Space Renaissance International. And my name is Sabina Heinz, and I'm the person uh, responsible for our webinar series. We are online now. On the 6th Hello. of November, I'm on the 6th of November, I'm delighted that you have come to join us. And of course, I would like to present you our special guest, uh, Scott Bryson. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, he will talk today about Orbital Farm, de-risking large-scale life support systems for space settlements. And I also would like to welcome our president, Bernard Foyne. Hello, Bernard. Well, welcome to, to Space Renaissance International uh, webinar. And uh, indeed, uh, we have had a very intense uh, two months in the last two months where Space Renaissance was active uh, uh, participating to the International Astronomical Congress in uh, Baku with a number of presentations and attending also the General Assembly and organizing uh, several events. Uh, uh, an EIC, which was the most diverse IEC ever in terms of the number of countries and so uh, And uh, we have been also active in the summer road trip where actually with our founder, Adriano, we uh, brought a little moon base uh, from Italy to France. And now this moon base is uh, in the Netherlands as a place uh, to uh, promote civilian space development. And uh, you can experience it uh, yourself. You can spend um, a few days or a few weeks in this moon base for four people. Um, and it's a moon base where we would like also to develop a platform for uh, new technologies. Uh, this would include eventually growing plants. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to uh, some development on orbital farms uh, before we have uh, uh, farms on the surface of the moon as well. But I think it's, uh, that there are very interesting development which are also connecting the space world, but also terrestrial needs and uh, world food uh, development, as well as a, a very um, interdisciplinary field from different tech, uh, areas, engineering, uh, uh, science, physical, uh, life science, uh, human factors. So clearly, uh, we are very much interested to see uh, what is the research and development towards orbital farms. So uh, welcome, uh, uh, Scott Bryson, to our webinar. Merci beaucoup, Bernard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you, Bernard. And I also would like to welcome Adriano Ottino. Uh, he's uh, also one of our vice presidents uh, and uh, former president and one of the founders of uh, Space Renaissance International. Hello, Adriano. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabine. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to have today uh, Scott Bryson talking about orbital farms. I'm very, very eager to listen to this and, and watch this presentation. I think it will be very interesting. And of course, very interesting for us at Space Renaissance because we, we yeah, this is the orbital industrialization and the geolunar space industrialization is one of our focus point. And uh, therefore we are very much interested to, to listen to this presentation and maybe even to deepen uh, that knowledge uh, later. And uh, so, okay, so very, very welcome, Scott. And uh, yeah, yes, let's go. Uh, thank you, Adriano. Um, it's uh, really a very, very important uh, topic. And I would like to welcome our audience. Uh, we have people watching from Reunion Island, from France, from UK, from Poland, from Lisbon, uh, as well in Portugal, and from the Netherlands. Bef uh, Scott, before I give you the floor, I would like to introduce you to our audience. Yeah. Uh, Scott Bryson spent his life and career as problem solver. From picking stones and baling hay, um, baling hay and farm fields, Frankensteining rotary engine cars and garages, uh, to becoming an entrepreneur at uh, 22 and building a multi million dollar advertising agency over a decade. 
After selling the business to a New York holding company and joining the M&A team, he helped to acquire 19 companies in a three years period. Uh, Scott uh, continued building a few more companies, advising investors and mentoring students and students and entrepreneurs, but soon realized that there are bigger challenges uh, the world needs solving, like climate change, world hunger, and healthier, plan uh, healthier planet. He decided that he could make a bigger contribution to the world and started by assisting to commercialize and um, scale a novel biotechnology company. Through this experience, he realized uh, the need for a circular project development company, a company that can rapidly uh, build large scale novel technologies, projects that make an impact in the world. That has uh, the ability to rapidly finance and deploy these projects all around the world uh, because they are Eight, uh, 821 million people starving every day and the climate changing faster than we can imagine. By selecting the right technologies, we can build closed loop farms to grow food anywhere on earth today and even in space tomorrow. The best thing is that these technologies already exist around the planet. They just needed the right vision and ability to fund it. Scott started Ab Ab Orbital Farm in 2018, and the company is now in the process of building closed loop systems that can produce vaccines and medicines for billions, um, hydrogen energy and food production all around the world from water, CO2 and electric electricity. Orbital, uh, Orbital Farm will build 200 circular mega projects around the planet to support and feed billions of people here on Earth today and spend the next 20 years prototyping and developing the technology to feed people in space. So you see, it is a really, really important topic. And uh, Scott, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Sabine, for the for the introduction uh, and, and the rest of everyone for having me here. Uh, let me just present my screen. Does this look OK? Yes. Great. All right. So it's it's a I pleasure. Do, I still have not full screen. Now it is, yes. Now it is, okay, great. Um, so as as I as we said at the beginning, I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, what it takes for de-risking large scale life support systems. Um, I spend all of my time in research focused on this idea of how do we develop a sustainable system, both for here on Earth, but also in space. We've got massive global ambitions, amazing and fantastic companies that today are, are scaling up to enable this capability and building the, the launch capacity and capability to, to get us into space. And this is a dramatic paradigm shift from where our knowledge base, where our ideas around experimentation, our ideas around settlement, where they have been since we've been enter we've, we've entered the space domain. And it takes a different type of thinking to think about how we're going to be able to position ourselves to be able to survive in these extreme environments. And the work that it takes to undertake and understand the technologies, the approaches, understanding the operational complexities of each of these different systems and subsystems it is an incredibly arduous and complex system. And I would argue more complex than the, the rocket science in order to lift mass uh, out of our gravity well into space. And it takes an incredibly thoughtful approach to, to be able to understand how to execute in this space um, you know, thoughtfully 
and and also with confidence that people are literally going to be betting their lives. And we're talking about hundreds or thousands of people bet, banking their life and betting their life that the, the, the underlying equipment and subsystems are there to be able to and will support them through um, many years of operation. And so while in the rocketry space, we can really take a significant amount of risk and blow up a few rockets, and that's perfectly fine, Doing this with life support systems is not really uh, a, a possibility. So Orbital Farm is really this, this entity that's designed to develop projects at this intersection of energy and agriculture terrestrially here on Earth. And through this and through the development of these capacity and capability, this gives us a commercial platform to be able to operate, to be able to test, to be able to integrate a variety of different technologies, all revolving around the, the core components of life support systems and, and selecting those critical pieces of that puzzle that we need to better understand. We need to identify the unknown unknowns. And you know, we've got a lot of challenges to get through here on Earth. We've got 9 billion people that are going to be here um, in, in, in a very short period of time, maybe even more. Um, this drives you know, a massive increase in our food requirements up to 70% more food produced than in 2050 than we do today. We have a significant amount of waste in our food systems and the land that this takes is, is astronomical on our planet already. And, and so where is this 70% gonna come from? This is really a core question. Um, and the way that we do this you know, really matters. Today, we're already at a pace where we're well over 800 million people that right this second as you're watching this video are hungry, are, are likely hangry, and does not lead to a productive, ethical, morally okay situation, but certainly in my opinion, um, that we're all right with, with that situation. And the situation that's happening here on Earth, it is already incredibly challenging. You know, we've got huge pricing volatility that, that's going on. This is driven by a number of factors from energy prices to global uh, geopolitics to, uh, to, to profit taking through inflationary um, moments. This is a major, major challenge. The other core component that drives volatility are yields in terms of what the, the, the food that we're able to produce, how much that, that's actually happening. And this is highly exposed to a volatile climate. So fluctuating and changing climate conditions don't necessarily have to have food producing regions experience uh, tornadoes or, or hurricane or, or floods. It, it's minor fluctuations that make major differences in yields or, or even for an entire region to be able to plant. You can take a springtime season and, and, and you can have too rainy of a spring and the fields are too muddy to get the tractors out to seed. And if you miss the crop insurance planting date, typically farmers will leave the field follow and not produce in that region at all. And, and this compounded on a much global larger scale becomes to massively challenge a lot of different food producing systems. And what we see and how this is reflected it is in the volatility of the food pricing. And we're already at you know, if we look back 60 years, we're at a peak in terms of how that food, food pricing volatility re really grows. And we're just at the beginning of the global warming situation that we've got. So we've got coming challenges and coming com components that we're going to need to deal with very seriously, very rapidly here on Earth. And and this, this is an important thing to understand because we need to go through a major change. We need to go through change in our energy sector. We need to go change in our agriculture. We need to go cha through changes in, in how we deal with industrial systems. And this can be a catalyst for change in, in a really amazing way. And it really can be enabling. And so core components of what our life support system is here on earth, like water, like energy, like food, these pieces can enable development in the remotest and the most desert. This is the Saudi Arabian desert over a period of a very short period of time. But the, the integration of water and the availability of water, fertilizer and energy has allowed the ability for food production to massively thrive um, in, in what was otherwise a completely useless um, area. And, and these are the types of approaches and thinking that we really need to move forward on. 
This is a really common thread around every person on the planet. It's deeply personal to every single individual. It ties us back to our family livelihoods. It ties us back to who, who we think we are as a human. And this has implications in space. You know, this is the part of the time of the day when the crew is able to come together across different modules from different groups and, and, and space agencies. It's the period of time in an astronaut's experience that they really look forward to some of the most. They get to share and try new things and trade food. This is a really cool um, collaborative type of place. And you need these types of, of, of activities where people are looking forward to and, and are inspired to, to contribute and and come to the table, literally. That is a really critical underpinning element to global collaboration terrestrially here on Earth. It's a really underpinning element for in, in space as well. And it's not insignificant the 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 happiness that you people that people feel in that situation comes from just actually the consuming of food. There's over 200 choices to select from um, that that are part of that process. There's a significant amount of waste that's also already built built into this system. You know, we dehydrate foods, we freeze dry them. Uh, they're, they're vacuum sealed and packed for rehydration and 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 storage longevity. But this creates a significant amount of waste in the system itself. This is apparently the shrimp cocktail that the astronauts, it's one of their favorites. It's been rated one of their favorite. Not the most appetizing looking, but apparently it seems to hold the taste pretty well. You know, the different space agencies produce different types of food. This is Jax's food options, for example. Um, you, you'll see a huge variety of different fun and, and, and creative options that can be paired and, and tied together. But this this is very personal to each individual uh, country and, and uh, astronauts they're from. Everything from a cheeseburger to even recently we've flown uh, an oven on board the ISS and baked the first cookies and milk that you see here. Um, that, you know, this ability for us to be able to generate and produce food in situ, this is really, you know, both a psychological benefit, but also gets to eventually becoming nutritional components that are really important. Food's a pretty big deal in terms of mass and cost as well. Sending an astronaut into space, you know, this carries a, a, a need for five kilograms per day per crew of food, water, oxygen, um, for the to, to support these astronauts, you know, sending that set, going up onto the ISS, this is a twenty two thousand five hundred US dollar per day cost that NASA would charge you as a as a um, commercial operator on on the ISS, a commercial astronaut on the ISS. Sorry, and so while being relatively close to Earth, this is not that much that big of a deal. This begins to be a big problem when we start to think, you know, where we're actually going to have larger amounts of people. The for, on, on the ISS, having a few individuals on, uh, or, orbiting on a space station um, you know, is one thing, but when we start to consider sending significant populations of people out to Mars, this is a, this is a completely different ballgame. We've, uh, we've got missions that are going to take two to three years of time you know, because of the orbital mechanics of where Earth and Mars are situated, we, we've got extraneous, extremely different situations that we need to consider uh, from how long we're staying on the lunar surface um, and, and what food and components that's going to take. Just a four-person crew on a three-year round-trip mission is around 24,000 pounds of food and packaging for a four-person crew. And, and it's pretty important to understand some of these fundamental elements, because when we go to scale this up and Starship is apparently designed to hold 100 crew, that three year mission, that's 600,000 pounds or nearly two Starships worth of, of food just to be able to support those individuals on that mission. This is a major issue because from a you know, use of Starships to, uh, for holding this from a risk that a one of these does not land properly standpoint to a nutrient degradation challenge uh, on storing food for these periods of time. You know, these are major issues that are, are not solvable in, in a couple of years of, of, of time. And when we, the practicality is not actually a hundred, supporting a hundred people because of the orbital dynamics, we may see a situation that a secondary crew launches in the second term in, in, within the second year to arrive and the first crew that's already on the Martian surface 
may not, for whatever reason, may not be able to get off of the surface. Maybe the propellant depot failed to produce enough. Maybe there was a, a, a downtime that was unexpected. Um, the possibility of missing one of those launch windows it, it is significant. And so really you need to design a system that can operate to support 200 crew, that could support the survivability for five to six years of time and maintain 100% uptime through that period. You need, there are unknown, unknown situations. These need to be identified and de-risked prior to the ability for individuals to commit that their lives and 100 souls or 200 souls to be able to go, go through this exercise. And these are huge challenges to get through in large scale operation systems that take a significant amount of resources and work and time to be able to build and operate the, these scale of systems. And this isn't just for in the short term, in the long term, we need larger populations of people. If we're truly going to become a multiplanetary species, this will necessitate that we develop a, a community of 5,000 to 14,000 people to avoid genetic drift. You know, of those, those populations of people, only a certain subset of those uh, will be adults in the age in the age range where they're actually gonna be able to have children and want to have children. And then you need to have enough diversity and genetic diversity within that to be able to maintain that survivable population. So for a 5,000 per person crew over a four year period of time, it's 40 million pounds of food. If you're gonna if you're gonna support a 5,000 person operation on the lunar surface or the Martian surface, sorry, it's gonna take 90 ships every two years to support that amount of food. And because of the amount of refueling that you need to do in orbit to, to make that happen, you know, you're looking at over 600 launches just to be able to support those individuals from that. So clearly we need we need the opportunity to be able to produce food in situ. And, and we could technically bring that food, you know, the cost of for, for 5,000 people, around 24 million US, um, just to buy the food alone, let alone this is not space package. This is this is freeze dried from a, um, a prepping standpoint, uh, from an emergency prepping standpoint type of food costs. But what you start to get into are challenges with nutrient degradation over that time period. And so when we're looking at trying to acquire or buy food and just and, and just store the quantities that are needed, there are major challenges that are that are part of this. Um, so we need to develop other capabilities of producing food beyond just taste and nutrition, which is really critical from a psychological standpoint, from a satiation standpoint, from eating healthy standpoint. You know, we crave and want variety and selection. And this is ties back to you know what our roots are, what 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 feels like home. When you're on the Martian surface, looking back at the at the blue star in the sky, you know, that feeling of home, which will have been lost, uh, and is a very long way away. Food becomes one of the very few moments in, in an astronaut's day that will bring them some level of pleasure and, and and happiness. And and so having that variety, having that capability. It, it is core from a psychological and a nutritional standpoint. And the food system is quite diverse. You know, it, it, we've got food safety components. We've got different nutritional elements, as we've been talking about, the usability of that food um, it, it, itself, how you're actually going to be able to eat it and, and consume it, how you're, you're going to be able to make this in a small enough form factor, having the different variety, variety and the palatability of does it taste all right? The stability of this situation and the food in this situation is also uh, a, a major challenge. So there are lots of different components and nuances to our, the, the space food system that need to be taken into account and designed into the system and into the subsystems and into the overall integrated approach. Um, all of these factors need to be considered. What, what is very clear and we're very sure of is we're gonna need a bunch of water. We're going to need a lot of water to support the the, the settlements. We're going to need a lot of water to, to, that is going to be produced from lunar mining activities. Um, we're going to need a lot of water just for the food production system and also for the refueling activities. The, these All of these different components necessitate producing a significant amount of water. When we think about you know, operating on the lunar surface and where we're going to find some of these things and even just the ability to survive through 
the the lunar night this is 14 days or almost 14 days of darkness that the the lunar bases or the operations are going to find themselves in this is a, this is generates huge fluctuations in the temperatures that these facilities will need to operate within and so when we're thinking about how we're going to be uh, developing capacity and capability to survive there, how we're going to be able to keep and maintain a food system uh, or habitats in these environments, let alone the radiation, just from a thermal perspective, um, these are significant challenges and temperature fluctuations from you know, down to uh, minus 233 in, in a crater to uh, well over 200 degrees uh, at, at some of the poles. Um, so we've we've got huge fluctuations uh, in in the in those temperatures to be able to to move and, and survive in, in and around these situations here. Oil off of cryogenic fluids of uh, maintaining assets without a phase change is a really critical component to life support systems, but also from a cryogenic fuel standpoint itself. So this takes us into and some of the work that we're we're undertaking our thermally efficient storage tanks. We're going to need to hold a lot of water. We're going to need to hold a lot of carbon. We're going to need to hold a lot of nitrogen um, and and all of the, and hydrogen and elements that go into the the use in life support systems. And being that entity that sits between the extraction entities that are going to be extracting and concentrating that water, and then the uh, the tugs and the depots to, to be able to be able to utilize some of that from a fuel standpoint, this is really the place where we we find ourselves sitting. And the quantity of water that's going to be there on the moon surface, for example, it's going to be pretty expensive to get assets onto the onto that lunar surface to the tune of $35,000 a kilogram in, in, in terms of cost. And so we've seen estimates already being generated that we're in order to produce the propellant in situ, we're, this is going to necessitate over 2,000 tons of processed water uh, every year being produced and developed on that surface. So these approaches and, and uh, what we're measuring against and for is, well, do we bring everything with us uh, that, that we need from Earth, or do we develop the cap capacity and capability to do this in space? And we know that defining any situation where we're going to be able to stay somewhere for a long period of time, you know, we want that ability to be able to recycle and reuse. We want that capacity and capability, that flexibility, that improved safety to come from that capability of developing um, that, that increased capacity and the increased reuse and producing. Now, this isn't to say that uh, just because we want to do this, this is current practice. Uh, well, there are currently 96 bags of human waste sitting on the moon today. So we have a number of different sites around the, uh, on the lunar surface that they just left bags of garbage and poop and diapers and other elements that they didn't need and left that on the surface that are sitting there today. An interesting science experiment to be going and understanding, you know, what's gone on with those microbes, um, you know, through the multiple day night cycles that they've experienced, uh, through through uh, the hot and cold variations, if anything has able to been survived. I mean, it's kind of would will be a cool experiment to check out in the future or time capsules, maybe to to say. But this is not the goal. The goal is to be able to develop closed loop systems where we can recycle and reuse and remake different components that are involved and from the waste streams, from the uh, the assets that we're bringing. And you don't have to be perfect um, to begin with. You can start with 1% and you can go to 100%. Uh, these are, uh, there, there's no direct line to it. There is definitely a, advantageous to moving towards more and more reuse. Today on the ISS, we're seeing water reuse cap capabilities north of uh, 80%. And, and with the new systems and development, demonstrating improving, getting to 98% reuse, which is likely at the theoretical limit of where we're going to get to. Moisture will uh, move its way into solid materials. Moisture will move its way uh, in and out of an airlock system. Uh, so there are you know, uh, limits to the capacity and capability to even recapture any of that, um, all of those individual molecules. And that's you know critical when we if we're trying to think about how do we do life support systems that could take us to a, another solar system potentially um 
that may be a, a challenge to deal with in the future, but it's currently sufficient. Uh, uh, 98% is fantastically sufficient for what our current needs are. But to re-illustrate the point of complexity, you know, this is an example that JAXA had, had worked on a number of years ago on, on supporting two astronauts and two goats in a module system. So you, you've got this ability and variety of different crops and plants to be able to produce and just the complex of number of systems and flow of systems that are required for supporting this. The European Space Agency has developed a Melissa system, um, which takes a different approach, uh, in, in, still all fundamentally similar to being able to use a bioregenerative uh, system to be able to develop and reuse some of the components and develop some of the inputs that are needed from CO2, oxygen, um, water, and, and the reuse of some of these uh, waste products that we see. The Chinese Lunar Palace One, uh, I, I believe, is currently one of the largest systems that's held people for the quite, for the longest period of time. Um, and so we've we've got capabilities and development that are happening around the planet in almost complete isolation from each other, for the record. Uh, and, and this is not the way to collaboration. This is not the way to accelerating our capabilities. Um, and and we do see some level of com uh, of uh, collaboration happening, but not at the scale that we need to. We have the capacity and capability of growing a small number of plants in the ISS, um, not even really sufficient for meal supplementation, more just, you know, people have eaten some of these crops, that's perfectly fine, but it's really, you know, very research and development testing capacity, um, very, very limited. And there's still so much we don't understand. Um, and these are all microgravity based. And we do know very clearly how biology struggles uh, without gravity. And so we do know that working and operating in at least partial gravity environments and, and partial strain does a significant amount to help improve astronaut health from bones to nutrients to um, uh, to muscle degradation. So we know that you know if we're thinking back to large scale systems, really these are going to operate on on planetary surfaces, um, on rotating structures, uh, but really within a gravity vector is really a, a, a core focus. We do have a couple examples of large closed loop architecture systems, um, but these approaches aren't really scalable to much use uh, from a commercial perspective. Um, and, and they're not really quite ready for, for us to go and duplicate this model to take to the Martian surface either, uh, or the lunar surface. What they've given us is a wonderful test platform with, with high fidelity in, in terms of understanding mass balance, in, in terms of understanding um, how large ecosystems interact with each other. Um, but this was not designed to be able to support a, a 10,000 person crew and produce their food and, and requirements. This was very much a, a, a wonderful experiment and it's, it, it, we're very lucky to have this still operational here on earth today, but this does not go far enough for where we need to get to. And nor do we need to have a fully closed system today. Um, what we need to have are systems that interact with each other, that you understand the inputs and the outputs of these systems and how they, how a vertically integrated system might work, where you're reusing the waste stream or the output from one process to become inputs into the next. And the outputs and the waste products from that become inputs into the next system of that. And this idea of circularity in how you design the architecture of the technologies that you're putting down and you're put, integrating together, this is at the core of how you develop and design uh, large-scale life support systems. And it's important to understand and think through how do you do this commercially and how do you do this here on Earth? Because the scale at doing this at where you can support a, a, a number of humans, a large number of humans, you can't really test this in a small scale and the systems that you utilize for a small scale will not be the systems that you utilize for, for the large scale approaches. So developing the capacity and capability from doing automated and vertical farming systems um, to, to being able to utilize aeroponic growing system, this, this is aerofarms, um, to being able to use the, the, the plants for more than one purpose. You know, the, the, the challenge that we've got in space is that mass and volume are our main limiting factors and the the use of the single use assets 
um, that are there, if they only have one use and have very low utilization rate, they're going to be abandoned pretty quickly. And so what you need to have are capabilities that can produce a variety of different products, can have high utilization rate, and can become significant utility for um, for crew and for supporting missions. So plants provide a great platform for that, uh, and, and not only just from food production, but also for their ability to be able to produce a number, a variety of different types of products. So they can be used to produce antibodies, they can be used to produce virus-like particles and, and vaccines, uh, they can be used to produce enzymes and, and recombinant proteins. These, the, the ability for us to utilize a plant growing system to have utility to be able to produce a variety of products in situation, this is super critical. And just being able to change out your seed and being able to change out your lighting recipe and your nutrient recipe, this takes the utility of having the capacity and capability of producing food and other highly useful products in, into uh, much higher use cases. Other areas, you know, in the cellular and microbial agriculture space, this is really where some of these specific nutrients and the specific components that, that uh, plants and microbes can also be used to produce. So cellular agriculture will play a core component into how we how we develop food systems when we start to consider large large scale development. Again, dehydrated food will definitely be possible and will will certainly be some of the early use case. But the palatability, the the mouth feel, the the satiation that comes from that um, it is woefully inadequate for long periods of time and large groups of people. Um, it will let people survive. Uh, but this is really where the opportunity is. And, and developing you know, cellular agriculture is a complex system. It takes bioreactors, it takes specific cell culture media, it takes, it, it takes specific cell lines and scaffolding systems to be able to support that, and all of the underlying subsystems that are part of that. They, it, it requires very key and core growth media to be able to grow and repeat those cells. And today, and how this is developed and used today, is incredibly wasteful. So for, for producing uh, a, a gram of, of product, of, of meat, you know, today we're looking at the high use scenario here. So we're, it's going to necessitate 41,130 grams of media to be able to grow and produce that. Now we think ultimately we'll be able to optimize this and get to, you know, a, a gram being able to need only, you know, just around 8,000 grams of media, but still a significant quantity of that. And so when we when we consider getting things into space and the launch costs that are needed for that, you know, and the and the up mass and the down mass needs that are associated with the waste that, that it's produced and the resources required, you know, we get to a point where it, it, this is incredibly inaccessible today in the high use scenarios until we've really developed the capacity and capability for reusing the, all the growth media elements for reusing a lot of that water and getting to high water reuse standpoint. This is now where it starts to tip over the threshold of, Hey, it makes more sense for us to bring this uh, from earth or produce in situ. And the same thing applies when we consider to try to run the same calculation on the lunar surface where is that tipping point you know it tends to be in on the lunar surface a, a little over um uh, the medium use case the reuse situation um would suffice that it becomes more economically viable to produce that food in situation and so now we you know these types of studies really help to help us illustrate where we need to get to commercially and terrestrially how we need to understand how these systems are used and developed uh, in, in commercial projects here on Earth. And this can really help us inform us into the types of systems that we need to integrate, how we test and develop the growth systems, what subsystems are needed and necessary, what are the energy demands, what are the thermal demands, uh, where are the gaps in, in the technology development readiness level for us to ready that capability of doing that uh, in, in, in space. And just to be clear, we're not proposing that an orbital farm is going to develop all of these wonderful and fantastic subsystems and technologies. We are the we are the systems integrator of these 
approaches. So we work with the experts and the technologies that are in each of these different areas. What we really try to do is to integrate these systems and into novel, into unique ways with this longer and deeper term purpose. And so this takes us to figuring out different components like space aquaculture, the ability to grow fish in in microgravity. This has already been done and tested and done multiple different times. Um, you know, there were challenges. Um, th- th- this is this is a not an in, not a um, uncommon challenge. And you know, we had fish that were very confused at the beginning, but it just took putting a light above them for them to orient themselves and not be confused. And we've gone through generational changes in these fish to understand and better understand the genetics of multiple generations. And so we feel like fish are gonna play a really great and important component, but then the question comes very quickly, how are you gonna feed these fish? So fish can come, fish food can come from a bunch of different sources. Microbial is, is a great example of one of those. Um, you know, we we have single cell proteins from fung- fungi to yeast, algae and bacteria, a variety of different technologies. Which one is the best one? Is it is it, you know, bacterial approaches or algae a little bit better? What about yeast, which we're very familiar in, in growing? And and the, the answer is that all of these components are really important and, and, and we need to be testing and trialing and integrating each of these different pieces to this puzzle, because there's some organisms that are better at producing some assets, some elements and others that are better at utilizing some waste streams. And so when you get to understanding, you know, ideal organisms, you know, really thinking through how do you uh, use existing waste stream sources that are there and present on the ISS or present when you've got humans um, in, in the loop in any large scale life support system. So this comes from, you know, we're going to have a lot of water, we're going to have a lot of oxygen and hydrogen, we're going to have a lot of methane and CO2 from astronauts breathing out, we're going to have a lot of urine to deal with, we're going to have a lot of biomass that comes from the plants that we're going to grow. And so it's understanding these different components, figuring out how to reuse that, and utilizing things like hydrogen oxidizing bacteria, as an example, to be able to produce and create different proteins and different Uh, molecules, different polymers, different oils that can be utilized for this. And terrestrially, this looks like gas, power to gas type of systems, uh, where you're using excess energy on a grid and producing hydrogen. And and this looks like carbon capture systems that we need to tackle from a climate change perspective. We need to be capturing methane from landfill and and, and biogas facilities and utilizing that. And it's through the process of actually developing and operating these facilities where you get into the nitty gritty of the engineering, where you do technology comparisons at large scales, and then you operate these facilities for long periods of time with investors that want those operations in steady state operation. This is really how we deeply understand how do we integrate all these different types of systems? How do we generate commercial revenue streams that can support our our space activities? It doesn't preclude us from you know, doing activities in space. Uh, right now, we're part of the European Space Agency in their Sustainable Agriculture and Food Industry Accelerator, uh, working on, uh, proposed, we've proposed an experiment to fly uh, microbes into space and grow them in this extreme environment in the hopes of producing a much more productive strain um, that can be rapidly grown and utilized here on Earth while using the same elements of, of waste resources that you know are currently a challenge to deal with, both terrestrially and in space. Uh, and so, you know, these are some some images from air protein or solar foods and solar foods, sorry, uh, on, on some of these microbes. You know, these single cell organisms are are able to be grown and 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 originally use case was defined for space applications. But these are original organisms from our planet. In, in fact, these may be some of the mo- the oldest organisms that are on our planet and have existed in before and prior to, potentially have existed before or prior to the o- great oxygenation event. And so these types of organisms are currently in your gut right now and in the soils outside your home uh, or in the bottom of lakes and oceans. And they're prevalent around the world, and, but it's really harnessing their capacity and their incredible capability of converting core elements into something usable um, that we can eat. 
But you very quickly understand that, well, actually to produce these types of products and produce these the, these types of use cases, this all comes back to energy and, and, and any economics and defining how you're going to operate this both in the space domain, but also terrestrially here is how low of a cost of energy are you able to achieve? And it's leveraging that low cost energy. That's really a, a core component to defining the economic or profitable ability for us to produce these, these food products. So we really look back to this dual use standpoint. Um, we really look to ha- uh, agrivoltaics is a great platform for doing power and energy, uh, power and food, sorry, production capacity. And so this provides a number of, di- we, we try to design projects that we can utilize this because it provides a number of different great uh, platforms for economic development, for space and like physical land utilization and the ability to protect crops and food production capacity from more extreme weather events. So solar panels above field fields can be can be used and, and protect against heavy rains and, and slow down erosion. It can maintain higher moisture content in soils and make the crops uh, produce more uh, biomass in, in the shady situations. You do use more land if you are just looking at it from the perspective of a solar energy because you're spreading your 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 facilities out wider to account for allowing more sunlight to come underneath. You can spread them out farther enough that you can drive a tractor between them and and have actuators that put the the panels vertical in the times when you need to plant, harvest, or or drive a, a tractor through the facility. So you've got this really wonderful integration, but these types of operations don't just organically happen because they're more complex to, to, to develop. It takes more land, it's more steel and, and uh, systems to be able to hold the, the, the solar panels up higher and specific actuators that can allow it to, to get into position for tractors. So it takes a level of development and effort to make these types of situations that are truly idealistic for the way that we need to develop here on Earth, but also synergistic for our need to, to do this in space uh, in the future. You know, this takes us to you know, producing hydrogen and, and utilizing electrolysis process and hydrogen storage assets and utilization of fuel cells. You know, the production of energy and the utilization of energy for any life support system is fundamental to its operation. The power goes out, the life support system's not working. The backup power system needs to be there. And, and on the moon, on Mars, this can't this can't be a fossil fuel system. This has to be utilizing these types of approaches. So understanding how these works, or how these systems work are fundamental to us defining a, an ideal model that operates, that utilizes the, this type of generation system that can deal with the variation and the fluctuations that come with these types of microgrid types of systems. And it has terrestrial commercial value today. You know, we need to transition our energy system dramatically faster than we are today. And we need to be utilizing uh, renewable energy sources for this. So this can come in the form of green hydrogen production for fleets, uh, can for, for rail, for aircraft, for aerospace sector. And so, you know, one of our first projects that we're we're tackling is trying to develop a project at Spaceport America to provide some of this capacity and capability to demonstrate the technologies to people who will who will be traveling on Virgin Galactic. This is a really great platform in place to demonstrate the interconnection of technologies and showcase to them in a practical sense of what these systems look like and operate in a relevant domain. One of the other areas that's really uh, interest for us uh, that is very understudied uh, around the world is how we deal with partial gravity. Uh, we we know that partial gravity is hard. We know that surviving the lunar night is difficult. Uh, the the Chinese lander uh, contained a small biological life support or a, um, a micro ecosystem is what the lunar micro ecosystem is what it was titled, um, and it failed to survive the first lunar night. It survived for nine days. Uh, when it was intended to survive 100, I believe. Um, and not all of, according to the images, uh, not all of the, the seeds have germinated. So we had a few seeds that did germinate from the selection. So the point is here that we know this is incredibly difficult to do. We know that this is going to be harder than we than we think. And there are many unknown situations with regards to, you know, are the nutrients that are going to be produced going to be the same? 
are the microfluidic fluidics inside different cells and plants going to perform the same? Are, are, are there challenges when we get into more complex systems uh, when we're dealing with hydrogen and oxygen and methane? Uh, are, are some of these different systems going to be sufficiently safe uh, and or, or are there risks that we don't currently know? We do know that, there, that the fluid dynamics perform massively different in, in microgravity versus 1G environments. Uh, and, and we have some level of sense of understanding in partial gravity, but there are many components and challenges that we need to go through to de-risk that. So follow on experiments and, and elements that we're currently exploring um, are, are utilizing rotating uh, satellites to be able to de-risk some of these ca capacity and capability. What you're seeing here is an image of EU Cropus that was launched in 2018 and operated for a year by DLR. Um, this was a system to be able to test and demonstrate the growth of tomato plants in the microgravity environment, sorry, in the partial gravity environments of both the lunar gravity and the Martian gravity. And this system um, had other tests that were flown alongside this within the um, uh, synthetic biology uh, space. But there was a fundamental challenge in the software update that was done after post-launch and, and it bricked the water pump system. So we currently have a satellite with some seeds that are waiting to be germinated uh, that are currently rotating at Martian gravity, um, but ungerminated because the water pump didn't function. So we need to refly this experiment. This is a fundamental element of, uh, of biology testing and understanding that we need a much better uh, platform for doing this. And this isn't something that can be done on earth uh, we need long-term capacity and capability for testing and de-risking. And, and there are plenty of other experiments as well. So I would encourage anyone who's watching who may be interested in conducting partial gravity experiments um, and, and needs to de-risk prior to landing on the lunar surface, um, that please reach out. And, and uh, we think that this is a great platform for global collaboration and, and other payloads to come on board and use this platform as a, a um, partial gravity testing environment. Um, all of these elements are fantastic and fun and interesting, but they all take investment to do. A large part of my work is also focused in on the finance side of things. This has taken me to developing uh, frameworks and standards for green bonds, which are long-term debt instruments to be able to finance some of these industrial facilities. It's taken me to developing uh, and, and working through accelerators specifically focused on venture capital funds and launching an, an investment firm um, in, in the process of doing this. And so the ability for us to be able to drive investment into these areas, into the preliminary design phase of project companies, this is some of the most impactful work that we can do. It, it defines where we're geographically in the world that we're developing, whether that's a small nation, whether that's uh, next door to a, a spaceport, uh, or, or whether that's in, in some place in Europe or North America or Asia or anywhere on the planet. It takes that initial preliminary investment into the, the design phase of these entities. That's really where the catalyst uh, and the opportunity for doing things that are novel and interesting at the same time as impacting people terrestrially here on Earth. And so this is not uh, uh, this is not activities and the scale of doing this it is not sufficient for the ability for us to do this through grant programs through different space agencies. There's not sufficient capital to make these facilities operate to design a number of these systems in a, any reasonable time frame from small granting applications. These facilities cost tens to hundreds of millions of dollars and then need to be operated for uh, decades of time. And so this really forces us to be able to go into the development of projects uh, at the commercial scale. But this also provides a fantastic opportunity because people that work at companies today can source product and materials. You can you can buy electricity from uh, from a renewable energy source and you can choose to procure that from a firm that is mission aligned with the, the capacity building for climate, the capacity building for space. And you can buy renewable energy that provides that provides revenue stream and sources for development of all, all the other components that we were talking about. 
And the same thing applies for food. The same thing applies for hydrogen. The same thing apply, applies for fertilizer. And so it's through this mechanism that we can develop an interest from an investor standpoint, the capacity and capability and the technology demonstration and the physical locations of the implementation of the of these assets on earth here today and develop that pipeline and, and, and capability of doing this in space when we do have the need, when we do have the capacity that's available for that. You know, this necessitates, this vision entirely necessitates the ability to collaborate. It, it necessitates some of the brightest minds that are currently working at other entities to come and join and, and be part of this. It necessitates other partners and other agencies and countries who maybe never even considered that they could have a space agency themselves. And it takes that level of people coming together to trying to solve these problems. So if you're from a place that has maybe unique food that has grown or plants that are grown in, in your area or unique food, unique food dishes that are, are really core to your identity um, and, and, and where your family came from. You got to figure out how to grow those crops in controlled environment systems. You got to be able to re reproduce those seeds. You've got to be able to germinate those seeds, understanding their lighting recipes, understanding their nutrient recipes, understanding their storage requirements, understanding how to use all the waste streams that are provide that are produced from that. You know, if if you're talking about a grain of rice, you know, it, it doesn't just you don't just grow the grain of rice. You grow an entire plant that's supporting that. And the, the rice is just a small little component of that entire plant. And so you got to be able to figure out how to use all of those components and reuse all of that. And someone's going to have to do that. And so it should be a, a country or a place of the origin of those plants and seeds. And they can contribute to this sort of global collaboration like we've done on the ISS and come together to pull together some of the brightest and the biggest minds. And this is the most expensive asset we've developed as as a human species. And, and this is a testament to our capability of what collaboration really looks like, truly looks like. And, and it, to me, and I think to a lot of people, this carries a significant amount of weight in terms of our ability to demonstrate, look, regardless of geopolitics on earth, at least we can collaborate up there. At least our astronauts are civil and carry on and collaborate and work together in partnership. That has an incredible value in the psychological state of everyone here on, on Earth. And this is coming to an end. The, the ISS is, is coming to its end of its life. We've been able to extend it and made got commitments to extending that, but this isn't sufficient for the rest of, uh, of, of like, it's gonna be done by 2030 for sure. And this capacity building, and we need a new type of project and as things are lining up on the lunar surface, we're getting some, uh, many more agencies signing on board to Artemis, which is great, but it's not sufficient. It's not bringing together other actors um, that currently are participating and are not collaborating in other ways. And so I think that through, through this vision of life support systems, we can develop that capability. And what we need to be doing is we need to be building a large number of these facilities. And it's not just one, it, it needs to be a few hundred. And it needs to be a few hundred because we're not gonna get it right the first time. We're not gonna get it right the 10th time. We're not gonna have a perfect system, even 50 different projects through this. What you need to do is you need to take all the different components and subsystems and understand how to integrate them. And you need to, you need to test this a number of different variety of different ways, different combinations. And back to the beginning part of the conversation is we need a massive global energy transition. We need a massive rehaul on how we deal and produce our food. We need a hugely increased capacity and capability of providing food for the people that are starving right this second. And we've got a new map of what that looks like. The resources of tomorrow are not just the minerals that are in the ground but they are the energy resources and the low cost energy resources are our wind energy assets, our solar producing assets. And what you see here is a map of where that exists. The black dots are the, are the cities of population with greater than um, a million people. And so you've got a completely new reworked map of where it's going to be cheapest to produce energy. And then therefore, these are the, going to be the places on the planet where we're producing those types of really any type of new product is going to be the most affordable to do.
And so the opportunity has just presented itself now with this increased capacity and our desire to tackle climate change with the ability for us to develop the capability of surviving in space. And so I think, you know, working in this space is the most exciting time of my life. I think it's the most interesting, uh, infinitely interesting problem to solve. I, I and, and it, it is incredibly joyful to be able to work on something that is inspirational and has the practical capacity to make significant impact on the world. So I welcome, um, you know, other questions and conversations. Um, and, and I really, yeah, I really appreciate the time being here today and sharing, the, sharing what I'm working on. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this interesting quest, um, lecture. Um, I would like to start with uh, taking uh, the questions from the chat. Um, Denise Alfonso, Alfonso Rivero uh, is asking, in terms of uh, the needed level of biodiversity, can man, uh, microorganisms, uh, to ensure a stable ecosystem, are there any studies that uh, suggest some kind of threshold? And uh, too little variety is more dangerous? Um, so, uh, there are two you, questions. No? That, that's okay. That's a, it, it's a good question. I, I'm not okay. immediately could you, aware. Sorry, could, could, you, could you stop uh, sharing? The oh, yeah. Screen, yeah. 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 Uh, Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, all good. Good. All right. Um. So I'm not immediately aware of a study that has gone through to understand the variety of needs that are there. Um, I think today our life support systems are, are not biologically based. Let's just start there. We, we, we are not using plants or microbes in any capacity to support any amount of oxygen, carbon dioxide utilization, water treatment. We're not using any biological sources for that in, in on the ISS, on the, in, it was never used on the shuttle. It was never used on Mir. It was never, it's not used on, uh, on submarines. You know, this is not the way that we currently do systems. The, the, uh, the electrochemical approach uh, which is which is what's used on ECLA systems. This ha doesn't need that variety. When when you start to get to larger populations of people, you need to start considering other types of technologies, and that that's that's an important thing to understand. And it's because today we can maintain small levels of waste streams for four, six, even even twenty different astronauts. The amount of waste streams that are there are negligible in terms of mass and negligible in terms of having to store and maintain those elements. It's when you start to get to larger groups, this is when you need to start considering utilization of a lot of these different waste stream sources. That defines then how you're going to be able to build up a biological based eco, uh, ecosystems or life support systems. And this is where the combination of biology and, and electrochemical uh, types of systems really will, will work together. When we're thinking about just this from the standpoint of how do you maintain biodiversity in a closed ecosystem and how complex does that need to be to be sustainable? Um, it, it doesn't actually need to be super complex to, main, to maintain very stable systems, as long as the system is simple. So there, there's a good example um, there is an entity that developed and used a lot of the calculations that went into life support systems to make these spheres that they had shrimp in. And they, these shrimp have lived for, I believe I remember reading 14 years, is the, the longest one. Don't quote me on that. Maybe it was five years. Regardless, it was multiple years. Uh, and, and, it, and it really, you know, it was a fully sealed glass uh, sphere. And in there, it has water. It had like a small little sea fan and, and, and some microbes in there to be able to support that. And they used it used sunlight to be able to, to reproduce that. Those microorganisms consume the waste from the shrimp. The shrimp eats those microorganisms and it's able to, to sustain it, it, its own life. And so in very simple and small systems, you can have very small and simple, uh, low variety 
Now, when we think back to our nutrition standpoint and a larger, you know, a, a community of a hundred humans living on the, on, a, on the moon's surface, you, it's a, it, the variety question comes in very differently because the, the variety is going to be driven by which types of products do we need to produce? Are we using some of these microbes to make polymers that we could use um, in, in, in other ISRU activities and technologies? Are we doing it to, because we need to produce a variety of nutrients that are degrading from the food that we brought with us? Uh, are we using these microbes to then consume waste streams that are accumulating that need to be dealt with? And so it's it's a complex question um, to, to, to do. We do know that, you know, terrestrially here, you take a teaspoon of soil and you've got, you know, a massive variety of microbes that live in, in, in concert with each other and and they they dance together they one provides waste stream sources from the other and only just you know in the last few months have we been we're developing the capacity and capability for even managing or controlling microbes in biomes and, and communities and we're this is just the very beginning stage of that so that was a very long answer to what i think was a fairly short question but um it's complex to know I don't think that we're going to arrive at an answer um, in, in the short term, but I do think that you need a balance of both. I think that what soils provide versus a hydroponic method is an embracement of chaos. I think that the, the understanding of huge variety of different microbes that exist and support the development and breakdown of all these different tiny little pieces of our the organic ecosystem i think that balance is arrived at and that some the stability arrives from this balance of in in chaos which is the antithesis approach to the physiochemical electric systems that we use in ECLIS and life support systems today which are we have one component that captures only co2 and that's it and we have one component that produces only oxygen, and we know exactly this amount of oxygen. And we know, you know these very nuanced individual assets versus a, a biological base life support system, which is much more embracing of chaos and letting a system balance develop. And I, and I think truly when we think to larger scale systems, it needs to be both. You need to have both of those compartments. We will have food producing areas and regions. We will want to have decorative plants in our habitats uh, and, and in our public spaces. We will want the ability to congregate and gather in a huge area at every you know week or, or, or things like that. That to support the ability to, for you know, 100 people to gather in one single room, you can't have a distributed life support system through, through an entire base. You've got to have that individual large room capacity to be able to deal with all of that CO2, all of that oxygen demand, all of that humidity that's going to be in that in that period of time when you have the, those people congregate in that area. So your system has to balance to that, that a plant, you couldn't design a plant system to deal with that. So you've got to have this integrated balance between each of them. Yeah. Uh, thank you for answering this question, so. Yeah, yeah, so uh, complete. Yeah, it's nice. Um, Andre um, Kotaski is asking, are you planning in orbit demonstration of your capabilities for food production and reduced gravity like Moon or Mars? Yeah, so that's that's what I was referring to with Eucropus. Um, I think that we need to refly that. And, and so I haven't identified a funding source yet to refly this, um, but you know I'm having and I'm working through active conversations with potential customers, um, you know trying to identify different space agencies that could provide funding and capital to support uh, reflying this mission and then doing other subsequent missions with that. Um, you know I, I, I also mentioned we're we're part of the uh, accelerator program that's part of ESA for sending. Uh, microbes up onto the ISS. So, you know, this is also the intention. Um, it is undetermined at the moment if that will, if we're going to be able to do that in a centrifuge or not. Um, you know, we're currently working through the the current commercial ser service provider capabilities and if that's going to be sufficient. But, you know, that needs to be work that's done, that's undertaken. We would like to support doing that more. Um, yeah, and just identifying funding sources for that is the current 
Stay yeah. tuned. Uh, before I uh, hand over to Bernard, I have a, another question here. What are the known impacts um, of microgravity on soil biome or biome? Yeah. Um, what are the impacts of the, the microgravity? So we, we do know that um, fluidics and, and how fluids are handled um, and and how they move through soils, this is very different in microgravity. Um, the the other component from plants or higher life forms perspective, you know, gravity drives the direction where the where the roots go. That's driven by uh, by gravity signals that the plant recognizes, and that directs where the the the, the root goes down. It's how it knows it goes down. So we've developed the capability of doing like seed tapes where the seeds are specifically planted in the right direction and, and the tape can go into the soil. And so we know that that, that it will continue to go down in those situations. Um, from, a, from studying the microbes in soil, we've done very little of this. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of a, a, an experiment that was done last year and flown um, with some different soil samples, but we've, we've had done very, very little soil science and understanding the microbes that are in, that are in the soil and how that changes over time and what the exposure to microgravity does. Um, again, my work is really centered around um, uh, partial gravity situations because I don't see microgravity as a, a, uh, the, the place where 100 to 10,000 people are going to be surviving and thriving. It's all going to be in partial gravity situations. And so you know, I'm interested in the microgravity work, but mainly mm -hmm. interest, mostly interested in partial gravity. Um, the other thing I'll say to that is that I can't develop earth analogs and the technologies that we're doing for microgravity, you can't really test viably here on earth. And this, this, it is critical to our mission, to my mm -hmm. reason why I'm here is to, we need to impact people here on earth and we need to help people here on earth. And if we're developing microgravity systems, we can't do that. And so focusing on partial gravity and understanding that, drawing a clear correlation between 1G and, and, and lunar and Martian gravity and understanding how that works, having a test platform in LEO can allow us mm -hmm. that. But you know, working and focused on partial gravity scenarios, and I'm very interested in, in, in that work. Mm -hmm. Um, I have another question. Um, could you put your email address uh, or your contact uh, in the chat? And uh, Adriano will uh, put it in the chat on um, YouTube uh, so people can contact you if they have some interest of cooperation or some more questions. Um, I, I would give now the, um, the floor to Bernard. Uh, I know you are keen on asking. In the meanwhile, he can put uh, the contact in the chat. Thanks a lot. Well, yeah. uh, thank okay. You. So, uh, uh, okay. Uh, I um, I always say that I'm going to retire in 20 years on the moon. And there, I promise I will be vegetarian. And uh, <laughs> your number showed me even more. That it's such a waste uh, to develop meat. And okay, eventually we will produce a bit some some uh, replacement for meat. But um, uh, also there are uh, ways to use uh, insects and other type of, of food uh, for protein uh, and, and so on. And we have been performing actually a number of uh, simulation in uh, analog uh, moon base, uh, isolated uh, moon base. And we use this uh, diversity of diet, including uh, insect and other ingredients. Um, so now my question is, um, um, we have also flown a number of uh, experiments already uh, to the International Space Station with uh, microbes, archaea, and fungi, and all type. And, and uh, this would be a good preparation to see uh, some precursor experiments we could fly to the moon itself huh, to uh, see what would survive and uh, um, what would evolve also on the surface uh, of the moon. So yep. one question is, uh, do you have an idea of things that we could do first on uh, analog facilities on Earth, uh, because uh, you are pro proposing very huge uh, farms. I think you have, you have 200, but uh, they, 
they, they are going to, to feed millions of people. But uh, uh, so uh, is there anything that in the short term could be done and scaled uh, to, for instance, support the needs of uh, analog moon base on Earth? Like we have one in Hawaii, you know, I see it, we are yeah. running. We'd love, we'd love to have a food production facilities. We could develop also one uh, larger one in, uh, in uh, Europe. Let's say if we want to to establish a Noah's Ark on the moon, we need at least 1,000 people. So yeah. something that would fit 1,000 uh, uh, of people and that could start also to have uh, some interest as demonstrator for the world food uh, movement. So do, uh, do, you, do you see a possibility to establish a, a mid-scale for your uh, for your project, a mid-scale facility of production of food also as a way to learn how to do it before you go to the very large scale? Yeah, so so it's it's a great question. And and it, and it's where I started, to be clear. Uh, where I started was trying to do this through uh, do, doing a larger mid-scale system um, and just financing that alone. And the challenge came when I started doing this, maybe it was too early. That's also a potential possibility because starting doing this work, really I started thinking through how to develop this in, in 2015, 2016 with some of my preliminary work. And, 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 and so it's been a long time working through these challenges. The issue is developing enough financing to be able to, to, be able to produce at, at, at a meaningful scale. Doing this on a very small scale, like on an individual at a lab scale, is perfectly sufficient. And there are a number of different firms that are working on this. And, and my perspective is that I would like, I would rather support their capability and support an ecosystem of, of a number of operators to implement their technologies into a single site. That to me, that is additive. It means that we we don't need to invest and in, and in, and in finance every single individual technology, which is not viable or feasible anyways. So if you could take the insect example that you mentioned, you know, a black soldier fly fly company that is developing black soldier flies for the use in aquaculture feed, you know, this is a great use case for dealing with food waste components um, and and a, 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 a nutritious high protein quality feed product that could go into feeding tilapia, for example. Um, would be a great integrated system, but the technology development specifically for the insect component, there are a number of different technology companies that are working on that. Bringing them together into this uh, European version of an analog or into high seas analog or any others, um, bringing those together in a in more integrated system would be great. It's identifying the funding to be able to support that at a meaningful scale and with enough variety that you're actually going to be demonstrating beyond just a single technology or two technology use cases. That's really at the crux of the challenge. And where I arrived at was that that achieving enough money in a short enough time period was not looking viable. And, 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 and so the alternative approach, which, which we're pursuing has been, let's develop a really large solar project. Let's work with a large multinational company that wants and has stated that they wanna buy renewable energy and they need hundreds of megawatts of solar power. And so we can develop a solar power project for them. And as a rounding error in part of that project, we can have that insect growing experiment. And it's a rounding error in the economics of the project the project's going to work for 25 years because they want to buy power for the next 25 years. And so we don't have to build a farm that's going to support millions of people, but we've got a revenue source that now we've secured and locked in for the next 25 years that supports this mission and vision because we've developed the project. We we choose where we're going to put the profit that that solar facility is going to make. And instead of delivering you know huge returns back to investors, we're going to deliver medium level returns back to the investors and we're going to be able to support the research and development activities that we want. So that's the methodology that I go through and how we design projects at larger scales is, is fulfilling these commercial contracts to be able to support the underlying integration of the technologies and the test platform that can be viable and a realistic pathway to capital versus writing a grant and hoping that ESA is going to support something 
um, that may take six to eight, 10 months or may never happen at all after three or four years of trying. Um, but uh, no, if, talk... up is, if it's so hard to finance, uh, do you have uh, possible customers in Africa, for instance, where you could have also a huge contribution to the hunger issue? Or... Yeah, so I, another good question. So I started developing a project in uh, Namibia and alongside a mining operation who had 5,000 people that are sur surrounding the operation and a community around there. They have multiple, mega, like I think like 25, 30 megawatts of power needs that they, they had. They had an instable, st stable power grid. Um, there's It's one of the biggest shipping ports in the region. It's under huge uh, water stress and, and, and they've, you know, they, they struggle hugely with that. So it's a great opportunity. And I tried to finance a project with it. And I went really far with you know, even engaging with the ambassadors and meeting together with the, um, the, the, the mining entities and the investors in that firm and the local individuals on the ground and securing the investment to finance that project just came to a point where I pitched it enough times. I just needed to move on to more uh, other opportunities. So it, it still comes back to the okay, great, you can put together these details, but getting an investor to the table that's being going to say, great, we will finance this, and this getting to a high enough size that you've got to have enough budget left over to be able to do any research and development activities that's not going to jeopardize the underlying economics of, of your commercial project, it, it's, it's just difficult to do. So I certainly welcome other opportunities, other possibilities. You know, they've Africa has developed a, the, a new space agency themselves. So you know, I think there's huge capacity and potential in in the ability to impact here. We need to be really developing in these regions who need to jump, who need to leapfrog all the garbage that we've de developed in Europe and North America, uh, and and they have this ability to do it right now. And so you know, I'm fully on board with that approach. Again, just coming back to, okay, where's the capital coming from? Who are those investors that are willing to support it? I'm trying to build a system to make that viable and happen. But yeah, just did the... you talk. Did you talk to uh, Bill Gates or to Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos? I, uh, I have not. I, I went and met with Kimball Musk. I flew myself down to go and meet with him at a, at a restaurant opening and had a chance to, he gave me 20 minutes of his time. Um, it didn't turn into... Something that you know here, here Scott, here's blah 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 amount of dollars. Uh, I have not spoken with Elon. I have not spoken with uh, Bill, but I would welcome a conversation at any point. <laughs> I think Bill, Bill Gates could be interested in uh, because he is engaged uh, in all these topics and um, medicine and and nutrition. Though I think um, if if you get the chance to present your project maybe um yeah okay yeah but uh sorry <laughs> Bernard I didn't want to interrupt you Bernard yeah well, so, uh, thank you yeah for the the, the question so you have no more questions I thought and so I think it will be interesting to, I am. to have an opportunity of uh yeah I mean we are looking at a, a more, small and mid-scale that could be relevant, for instance, of sustaining a community of 100,000 people on, on the moon. So there could be certainly some synergies there. And um, the way, the saving that we would operate by operating an orbital farm or a, a moon uh, farm, uh, then uh, could be a way to find some of the capital for this case. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, working on the R&D that would serve both terrestrial application but also uh, sustainable, uh, uh, okay, uh, civilian development of the uh, moon and Mars space. And, and, and just, to, just to be uh, round off my statement uh, on the um, on the investment side of things, I, I I do think that we've arrived at a solution that that does solve these challenges. It doesn't solve it directly in hey, this is a hundred percent of the research and development capital going to financing this research project. But this approach with a commercial and uh, outcome-based approach that we're looking for here, this is perfectly aligned with uh, where capital actually is as in wanting to flow into climate action and impact investments. This is this is a exactly where money wants to go to, and that what they need to what we need to do in order to make that possible 
is de-risking investment opportunities for investors. And the, and the opportunity is an ability to be able to finance this early preliminary project design work. This is also the major gap that we've got in the commercial industrial scale finance money. You know, the institutional capital wants to buy and have committed at, at, at COP26, I believe they committed to financing the energy transition, but they have an inability to take high levels of risk. They carry $110 trillion of assets un under management, but in, in the sovereign wealth funds, in the insurance groups, in the banks, uh, in the pension funds, these for sources of capital have trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollars of money in, in, to invest in this. They just can't take the risk. And so the opportunity for regular investors, you know, these are still high net worth individuals, is in financing some of this early stage work. And that's really at the core of, of how you de-risk. How do you build a billion dollar project on earth? It, it, it's you finance the engineering work, you finance the preliminary design of a billion dollar project. That's how you that's how you catalyze change. That's how you catalyze an outcome that you want to do. And so that's really the mechanism you know that we're pursuing uh, on on developing these very investable opportunities for for investors that they don't have to take you know a twenty five year outlook on a, on a solar project. They don't have to take you know a, maybe a fifty year outlook on a large scale life support system on the moon. You know, maybe that's only maybe that's only 15 20 years away from now from from its need but you don't, you don't have to take that risk profile in financing that you can take a much lower risk in investing in these supply chain assets that we all need to go through transitioning and you can you can still achieve the space dream and the space missions at the same time uh, just to my last uh, but, um, still if you could show some pilot project much yep. smaller scale where you show that okay you can satisfy your customers uh, you make some some advance uh, then you you can also lower the perception of high risk because you yep. can show a project uh, terrestrial it doesn't have to have the complexity of a space project yep. um, also i was a bit doubtful about your map of you know extreme high wind extreme solar power well i live in a in the Netherlands, where actually we are now equipping all our houses with solar panels. Yeah. So even so, I think there will be also for people in the mid countries, not in the extreme, some uh, okay significant uh, revenues uh, of uh, power. Then you could have also a solution which is smaller, more adapted to a okay, smaller scale of uh, uh, grid. Yeah. Not to mention there are some countries. That don't that have nuclear power, but uh, you don't absolutely, up, and uh, they will still produce uh, energy. So also, there could be a site uh, where you could establish uh, uh, your facility, like in France, for instance. A absolutely, France is a beautiful place for this. You know, the the amount of nuclear energy and excess capacity that's there. You know, southern areas in Fr in France are really well suited from a solar perspective. Um, you know, there's a huge desire for high quality food products. Um, so there, there are a lot of the different components in France, in Spain, in Morocco, in Italy, in Greece. Like there are many different good economics. In, in fact, even here, I live in Toronto, in Canada, uh, and so you know, even in around here, we've got a huge amount of greenhouse production capacity. You know, three hours south of here, so more. I believe there's more greenhouses there than there are in the entire U.S. And so it's got this huge. A greenhouse production capacity and the, still the ability to be able to develop projects economically viable. That that map was was demonstrating the low, where the lowest cost places will be, and these are the opportunities from an economic development standpoint because you're going to be able to produce power for below three cents a kilowatt hour, and so you're going to be able to create products there and export them to to any other places and have a significant competitive advantage because of the your levelized cost of energy is going to be the lowest. And, and so that's where you, know, you build, say, a ferment, large industrial fermentation facility there, and you could produce, you know, 100,000 tons of your product at, the, at that point. You know, that's enough to support uh, four and a half million people of their daily protein requirement from that facility. You know, you, you can have, you know, a massive country scale impact 
in your food production capacity and have a competitive advantage in doing those things in those regions and areas. That was sort of more where I was, I was pointing to, not that you have to do that. It, it's just, these are the, if you're going to choose a place that's going to be the most profitable to do it, those are definitely the areas at where you've got that wind and solar overlap. Like great countries, I think, is the one you mentioned. And I think uh, they have a good standard of uh, innovation, uh, creativity, uh, a good quality of life. These are all places where we have Space Renaissance uh, members, actually. And uh, actually, uh, yes, uh, if that would be a way also to drive the new Space Renaissance out of developing uh, a model where, uh, you know, we solve our problem at large scale yep. with uh, space innovation. Yes, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Scott. And yeah. I leave uh, the floor for other questions. <laughs> oh, Adriano, it's you turn now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, no, I was thinking about uh, the uh, different possibility. And uh, of course, I'm uh, really, uh, what can I say, very happy uh, to have seen this presentation. It's a so rich of concepts and also of uh, uh, scientific uh, concepts that uh, were a little bit hard to follow, but uh, I think altogether it gives an uh, it gave me it gave me the impression that uh, uh, you are working uh, starting from human requirements. Yeah. So your work is a humanist one from the philosophical point of view. You're not oriented to make the uh, very elegant uh, system. No, you 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 think about the human needs and uh, how to go ahead and uh, and solve problems and so on. That, that's very. Um, very, very, very nice, and and uh, no, nice is is a, is a, a limiting word. I think it's wonderful because it's not so common, uh, and uh, uh, very, very near to our uh, space renaissance humanist uh, philosophy, and uh, therefore the invitation to join us as a member is uh, you will be very welcome to to join. Well, Thank you. Uh, having, having said that, uh, that this is of course an invitation also to all the uh, people that are watching us. Uh, we are an activist uh, organization and we live uh, upon the, the port, the fees of our members. Therefore, everybody is invited to join. However, what I wanted to say, uh, in your presentation, you talk about uh, um, let me say, rather big communities, not only um, scientific or exploration, uh, small uh, communities, but when we start to think about a hundred, even only 100 people, that's yeah. a community, uh, yeah. something more. And if we think about 10,000 people, that's a little town. Therefore, we are definitely talking about civilian uh, uh, settlements. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that brings a lot of uh, of problems. No, not only the food, but the food is primary, of course, <laughs> <laughs> because yes, uh, and uh, okay. Having said that, uh, uh, like uh, today, right today, because I was working uh, to finalize a book that I'm preparing, so I was looking at the. And Gerard O'Neill, how he started to think about his uh, rotating infrastructures, the colonies in space. Yep. Well, it was it was 1969. He was teaching at Princeton, Princeton University, and he decided to challenge his students uh, with this this question. Do you think that a planetary surface is the best place for a human settlement, space settlement? Okay. Uh, so the students worked a, a lot. They made researches and, and so on. And then the, the answer was no. Mm. Uh, and that, yeah, that was the origin of the, of the, of the large uh, cylinders or torus rotating with simulator yep. gravity. So my question is, in your work, you 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 talk about uh, um, par partial gravity, 
And uh, yeah, of course, I agree that uh, zero gravity would be useful only for some industrial production that grows well in, in zero gravity. So yep. it, it could be the central hub of a large rotating infrastructure. Yep. Uh, my question, in your work, in the context that you have with other groups, etc., is there anybody thinking about start experimenting with uh, 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 not artificial, simulated gravity, because artificial gravity is another thing, uh, simulated gravity by rotation. Uh, because I think that to, to uh, the, 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 the answer by the students of, of uh, uh, Gary and Air, uh, is, is right. Is, uh, yep. uh, surface, one, one sixth gravity or one third gravity is not the best uh, place. The best place is a, a large enough structure that by rotating can generate 1G with a very low Coriolis effect. So it, it must be large, okay? And yeah. it should rotate slowly, slowly enough in order not to be our equilibrium, not to be disturbed and, and so on. However, yeah, I think that the interesting uh, ex uh, experiments if if we are serious and we are really we want to start settling outside uh, yep. Earth, it would be to yes definitely to experiment the lunar gravity and the Martian gravity, but but also to start making some laboratory rotating laboratory. It would be enough to have a long cable and make two laboratory rotating around a, a hub. Yes, to, to start working. But why not? Yeah, I know why. Is because so far, so far, everybody, the agencies, only thought in terms of science and exploration, and not in terms of settlement. Yeah. So right now we are starting yeah. maybe to work in the in 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 in, a, in a, with the target of settlement. So we should start thinking about uh, working with simulated gravity. What, what what do you think? I I, I mean I I think that we we have vastly underfunded and vastly underestimated the challenges that operating in that environment will take. I, I think that we have test platforms for uh, uh, for doing some level of partial gravity in, um, uh, in parabolic flights, on aircraft, uh, on New Shepard. You can rotate New Shepard and, and conduct a partial gravity experiment for a few uh, for for period of time, um, this can give us some level of understanding. Um, the EU Cropus, I think, was our best our best case at this so far. Um, I, and, and you know, it, it is still rotating today, and so we've got years of time of demonstration that maintaining a partial gravity environment, maintaining a thermal stable environment, is possible and doable with this platform. So I think yeah, that that on Earth, on Earth. Uh, not on Earth. No, this is in Leo, low Earth orbit. Oh, okay. okay. So the, you can't do partial gravity. You you can do partial gravity on Earth in one of two ways. One, you can do the parabolic flights, and yeah. you can get seconds, twenty five seconds of time. You know, very short seconds of time to be able to test those yeah. those partial gravity situations. You can set up some some level of a drop test for a very short period of time. Aside from that, you know, in the plant biology space, you can use what are called clinos, 3D clinostats, which which are you know rotating and, and have multiple rotating. Um, I forget all the proper terminology for it, but it essentially is like the the astronaut testing where they they're holding on with their arms and their their feet and they're spinning around to try to oh, oh, disorient yeah. themselves. So you can do this. There's been experiments that have used that a small version of that, and then put that clinostat in a centrifuge and so you could the interior point will feel not any one direction of gravity pulling on it and then it will feel a small amount of pull as that whole system is in a centrifuge mm -hmm. that could be the closest that we could get to any partial gravity environment simulation on earth but it's woefully inadequate uh it, it is not representative yeah, it's like it's it 
you can't really trust that on a life support system that is going to function or a plant growth system or using that as an analog to test a variety of different plants that would may survive well in those situations. Uh, so, uh, and nor could you mature a tomato plant to produce a tomato in the timeframes that, that it would take and continue to operate that test to know, you know, are the, all the nutrients being produced in the same quantities as they were? Are they the same nutrients that are being produced? Um, you know, to, so you, you can't do that with enough fidelity anywhere on earth. And so this is really why we have to go to rotating structures in microgravity to be able to test that or practically on the lunar surface. Um, those are really our only two scenarios. So Eucropus, to answer your question, is one location. Um, uh, vast space, I believe, uh, are intending to do a rotating system. Um, uh, Jeff Greenblatt's business, um, uh, what is it called? There's another entity that is that is uh, has been uh, developing capabilities for this. Um, uh, Jeff Bezos has mentioned, you know, he's he's a fan of this approach and system. Although I've not seen any notice or. Oh, Bezos, Bezos was a a, a fan of Jerry and yeah. All of his plans of uh, geolunar industrialization and so on come from yeah. from Jerry Donay, of course. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think there's interest. I don't think that there's enough action. So I think, you know, we need to, like I said, we the easiest and the fastest platform is for us to refly an existing proven system that's flight ready now. Uh, you know, we need to manufacture another one. But, you know, aside from that, we need payloads and customers to to do that. Um, but yeah, we've got to we've got to do this, especially for assets that are risky. You know, here's the situation I don't want to happen. I don't want to build a bioreactor that mixes hydrogen and oxygen or methane and oxygen in the bioreactor to produce and grow bacteria that then we discover a mistake on the lunar surface and it blows up the lunar lander. And my experiment is the one that that caused the destruction of everyone else's equipment or that experience. Know it before. Yeah, of like, course. I, yeah, I don't want it, I don't want that risk. <laughs> it would be it would be very easy if you make a large enough to, 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 toroidal structure, you can make a three uh, three uh, torus. One is large enough to have a 1G. Then you can have a smaller one with uh, um, one third G for the Martian simulation and another one, uh, one six G for lunar simulation. Then yep. with an orbital uh, big station, you could have simulation of all of these environments before going to the moon, before going to, to Mars and, and, and so on, experimenting everything. That would be uh, that would be fantastic. I I'm yes. I'm up for that. You know, I I I don't want to build the entity that does that. That's not that's not the business model I want to pursue. I want I would be a customer. I would be a payload customer on course, on a project yes. like that. Um, you know that the project of the International Space Initiative that uh, proposed to uh, to build a one G uh, rotating facility. I suggested them to add also the. One third, one six G, and also in the center, still keep a bit of zero G, and you you need some time yeah, to have a. Yeah, of, of course, you can have a laboratory. <laughs> of course, you can have in the center a zero G uh, yes. experimentation laboratory. Of course, yeah. yes. Well, good. Yes, Thank you. Uh, I take a last question from the chat. Um, Guy Pinoli is uh, asking. Willi Lama, yeah, reunion is developing Klinstad uh, with students. Uh, it's not a question here, it's a remark. Okay, also uh, you can direct um, to him, you can write him an email, Guy. Okay, um, I would like to close uh, this webinar. It was a really lively discussion. I like this. Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, I would like to thank you, Scott, for being with us, uh, to our audience for joining us for such a long time. And uh, thank you to Bernard and Audre Adriano. And um, I would like to mention our next webinar on the 20th of uh, November. We will have uh, Daniela, uh, Daniel Futzeler um, as our guest. Uh, she's an artist. And she wrote about a book about um, the secrets of the universe. 
in Dutch, unfortunately. Uh, I hope it will be translated. Uh, I have seen the pictures uh, and it is an amazing book. Uh, so you can be cur curious. Yeah, also if you need a Christmas uh, gift uh, because you're in the, <laughs> the Netherlands. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, but she will talk in English. So thank you again, Scott, for being with us. And I hope you will join us again and look at our webinars. You will find interesting people. Uh, maybe you can get in touch with them and maybe you will get some emails. We uh, could think, sorry, sorry, Sabine. We could think for next year in, in, uh, in autumn, maybe another webinar deepening some of the arguments you 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 gave us a, a, a scenario uh, today but maybe we can go inside in more details in some in some of the uh, of the topics uh, maybe uh, yeah, already yeah, report because maybe you will have your first farm uh, built yes and this is what i wanted to say maybe a first project running already that would be okay. amazing Thank you so much. I wish you all a nice evening and uh, Bernard, that you come good, good from, back uh, home to DC. Europe. <laughs> yes, I'm and... Washington DC and the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab this week. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Also, bye.